important place in the history right now is that we're live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Q covering Red Hat Summit 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of the Red Hat Summit here in beautiful Boston, Massachusetts. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight. We, I'm joined by uh, Todd Wilson and Shay Phillips of the BC Developers Exchange. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks yeah. for having us. So the BC Developers Exchange, you described it to me before the cameras were rolling, as helping the British Columbia, British Columbian government think differently. Talk a little, explain, un unpack that a bit for our viewers. Sure, so it's, it's been a journey for us. We've evolved over, over the while, so we've been going for about three years now. Um, what we wanted to do, we recognized that government had fallen behind in its uh, technology practices and technology utilization, and we were trying to participate in the tech industry uh, that's growing in BC, and we were finding that it was a pretty big gap in understanding. We didn't really speak the same language. We didn't really understand what their needs were. They didn't understand how to work with us. And so we started exploring ways to connect better. So one of the things we recognized that we had on our side was uh, technology assets of data. We have tons and tons of data that's valuable to the tech industry to use for their apps. So we first started by opening up that data and then realizing that just open data is part of the story. We need APIs, so providing API access. And that was just kind of part of the story. We needed to actually start collaborating on solutions. So then we brought the province into GitHub and we're doing open source collaboration on GitHub. And it's kind of morphed into a, a much bigger picture than we originally started with, but it's been a really exciting way to work. And the, the, your, your realization that the, the, the government was, was a little bit behind here, you were working in, in a different track than the government, that's not um, uncommon, wouldn't you think? I mean, this, yep. the government is not known for for innovative practices. Yep. yep. So, did it take um, did it take some persuasion on your part? I think that um, you know it's it's mixed. So there's certainly factions within the, within the government that um, there's a bit of pent up demand, right? So there's there are people who are very quick to kind of get on the train, and then there are other groups who who do need convincing, and it's kind of a work in progress. So we're you know building building. Um, you know, collaboration across across government all the time, but we, we certainly didn't have trouble finding people um, within government and within the, the tech community who wanted to come along uh, with us. So talk about some of the projects that you're working on to make government run better. Sure, so there's a, a couple of uh, examples of how um, you know moving into the open source just made sense for government. Uh, one example that uh, we've used in a sort of why GitHub makes sense for what we're doing. The environmental reporting branch of the Ministry of the Environment <coughs> is responsible every year for producing a report on the water quality, air quality, all the basic things that the environment uh, you know, is care about and all of the um, different universities and uh, academic institutions consume this report and then do their analysis on it. One of the things that was always a challenge is there was always kind of wondering, you know, are these numbers cooked? You know, <laughs> are you guys actually reporting on the actual findings? Or are you cleaning it up a little bit? Right. So what the uh, Environmental Reporting Office was able to do is they published the code on GitHub, the data in our open data catalog, and it was all there 100% transparent for anybody to recreate the results. So they could download the code, have it running on their laptop, they could download the data, bring it in, and run the numbers. <clears throat> what ended up happening after a few months, they got an issue in GitHub. Somebody created an issue, said it's broken, it's not working, I can't get it to go. And a little bit of investigation, and they found out that the nature of the data, one of the data sets they were using had changed, so it, it broke the program. And so the developer that was responsible for it wasn't going to fix that until next year, next time to run the report. So he said, thanks for pointing out the error, but you know, I'll be fixing that next year. And a day or two went by, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he got a pull request in GitHub. The guy who discovered the issue actually went away on the weekend and fixed the code himself and said, here, I fixed it for you. It's, it's all ready to go. And so that's sort of that whole community spirit that just starts to grow naturally when citizens can engage with government on such a personal level and work on something together and collaborate in a space that previous to that had been kind of adversarial. You know, there wasn't a lot of trust there. There wasn't sort of that good feeling of are we getting the right information? 
all of a sudden to turn into a real collaborative partnership is, is that's the model that we want to see. Well, I'm wondering if we could turn that, that example into a real metaphor for what we'd like to see overall with a more engaged citizenry uh, who is uh, people who want to work alongside or with government uh, to solve these problems. Exactly. Yeah, we're all in, we're all in living in the same space. We're all using the, the same resources. We're, you know, the government is there for the citizens and it's by the citizens. So to be able to work together and work openly is, is a real strength, uh, real power play. So, so that environmental uh, code that you just gave was a great example. Talk about the um, talk about some other ways that you're that you're working with the government. So one example that we have is um, sort of an, an internal sharing um, scenario. So previously, uh, when applications were built within Gov, there it wasn't an easy way for um, applications to be shared across um, different different ministries or agencies. So they'd get built and they'd kind of get locked away and, and uh, you know, used for that one particular business function. Uh, what we've been able to do with GitHub uh, and, and by having shared code is to have projects come along and actually borrow what's been done already and repurpose those applications. And that gives them a great starting point. So there's a lot of common things that every application would have to figure out. And so by having um, these starter kits, essentially, um, development teams can get a leg up on, on taking on new projects. And so that reduces the uh, you know, time to market and the, the cost, ultimately, and also makes things a little more consistent. And what about the project you did with the highways? OK, so that was one where uh, there was a collaboration on a standard for uh, reporting of road incidents. So it's called Open 511. And so this was uh, an international standard that was being developed. So there's various states in the US and provinces in Canada and a couple of other international jurisdictions that collaborated on this specification for highway event APIs so that data could be shared easily. So the Ministry of Transportation in BC participated in that and collaborated and, and contributed to it. But then they also exposed their data using these APIs. But then they didn't end up building anything on it. They just kind of said, here, it's, it's available to use. Go figure it out. So what we really wanted to do there is, it's really not the government's job to be building all of the end product apps. We're kind of the resource store for the, for the building blocks. And then what ended up happening, an opportunity got recognized by a mobile app developer in uh, Victoria. They saw an opportunity to take these APIs and build a little notification app so that if you put your route in, it'll ping you notifications if there's obstructions or traffic or whatever may have you and show you the webcam uh, image that is on your route. So really interesting solution that Gov never would have built. Like we would never have built a mobile app for for that. You know, we, do, do you? How do you ensure security? That's one of the biggest themes of this conference: is making sure the data is in fact secure. It's what we, we you hear over and over again as a big concern. How do you address that? Sure. Do you want to? Yeah, oh, yeah, I was getting to that. <laughs> so we have a data center that we run um, with in partnership with HP and the data resides on premise in that data center. What we're using uh, Red Hat OpenShift container platform is sort of all the front end facing interfaces will go through OpenShift. So when people are accessing the data, the access is controlled through gateways and, and however projects get set up in order to control that access. Meanwhile, the data is still sitting securely in the, in the network zone uh, back at the mothership. So we've, uh, what we found with the OpenShift container platform is the developers don't necessarily need to worry about a lot of the technical policies and network policies that are part of that security standard because that's handled by the platform. When we built OpenShift, we built it compliant to all those policies. And so developers can come into the platform, just start working, and as long as they're not, you know, punching out uh, data with has personal information out to the internet. You know, of course, there's things they can do wrong, but as long as they're using the platform as it was intended, they're compliant right from day one. In terms of recruiting and retaining talented developers and, and, and talented technologists, do you find that a challenge? I mean, as we, as we said before, you don't necessarily think of the government as these hotbed of innovation and creativity. Is it difficult to, to get the best and the brightest to come work for you? I think that was actually part of the strategy around um, 
adopting uh, tools like containers and open source was actually to make uh, Gov more compatible with the uh, IT market. So, um, you know, using the same tools that the private sector uses. So there's a more seamless transition from a recruiting perspective and people can, um, you know, they're not, they're not sort of going back in time when they, when they go and, uh, and work with government. So that was definitely a deliberate, uh, deliberate part of the strategy. So it's the tools, but then also the projects. Are, are, do you, are you finding coders and engineers who, are, who, who want to dig into these projects? They do, but we want to work with them in a different way. So okay. we don't necessarily want every developer to be a Gov employee. That's really not the model. We would never scale properly that way. So what we've done is we've created a new procurement method. So in, in government, procurement is hard like it is in a lot of enterprises. Contracts and all of these things get complicated and take time and you have to wait maybe a few months before you actually get the resource that you need. So what we've done is shortened that timeline down as much as we can and also micro-sized the work as much as we can. So if a project is running on GitHub and they have an issue, they can post that issue and put a dollar sign associated with it from $1,000 to $10,000 and kind of do a bounty and say, hey, development community, we want this fixed. Can you do it? So developers can engage with that. They can write a short proposal, 100 words or less, of what they would do. And then if they get assigned the work and we accept the pull request, we'll pay them using PayPal or write them a check or however they want right on the spot. So we can go end to end from problem, proposal, code, and solution literally in a couple of days. Whereas before that would have taken a few months and the engagement would have been much larger and much more expensive. And are you finding that that is in fact having the impact you want in terms of the workforce that, you, that you're trying to attract? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think there's definitely been interest in the uh, private sector kind of independent freelance developers are, are generally pretty excited about this and some of them are you know, downright shocked to see that this is such a, a progressive thing that, uh, that the Gov has, has uh, undertaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had comments from developers saying, oh, I never knew working with Gov was this easy. And, and uh, that's the way we like to hear it. And, it. and hopefully it will become easier too. Exactly. We think about um, the government and the technology industry not necessarily working together, particularly when it comes to uh, this new digital world that we're living in. And, we hear so much about the benefits of automation, but also the fact that automation is going to have a big impact on jobs. Do you think that the government and tech need to be thinking together about the effects of this and, and working together to make sure that we aren't seeing more displaced workers? Absolutely, I mean, I, th I think we're, we're, you know, no one has a crystal ball, nobody can tell what's going to happen, but if we don't start thinking proactively about some of these issues, workforce issues, we're, we're going to be caught flat-footed. And, and so one of the things that we've been trying to prove along is automation doesn't necessarily mean losing jobs. And so we've, we've been trying to, to explore what the workforce shift looks like. So what we find within the little corner of sort of DevOps automation that we're doing is it's not that we're taking jobs away from people, we're just moving them to a different part of the value stream. So they're usually moving further up the value stream closer to the business so that they're actually much more engaged with the day-to-day -day business of Gov and less engaged just with the tech and the plumbing. And so by moving automation in, we're actually connecting the business and the technology closer together. What are some of the future projects that you that you envisage um, working closely with the government to change the way citizens engage with government? Sure, um, we've got a couple of big projects coming up where we're looking at uh, different models of uh, reaching citizens in meaningful ways. So there's a sort of personalized service or uh, some kind of you know citizen dashboard, however you want to phrase that. That's one of the things that's on our wish list of wouldn't it be great if. Um, we also have partnerships that we're looking to explore in different areas with sort of big data and data analytics. Because government has so much rich resource data, we're looking for ways to get that out and get that available, but one of the challenges is just the sheer size of it. So the big data equation and big data analytics are very interesting things for us in the future, because if we can provide expertise in that area, then tech sector and uh, industry partners can come and, and participate with that data and, and just make it better. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us, Todd and Shay. I appreciate your time. Thank Great. you. Thank you. We'll be back with more of the Cube's coverage of the Red Hat Summit 2017 after this. Oh.